Hello, everybody. So today we are going to start reading Prodigy officially, which is really exciting. Um, I have some really cool news, which is that I actually I'll do it right now as I'm waiting for people to log on. I found a copy of the PDF of this book online somehow. So I'm going to post it on Google Classroom right now, just in case anybody wants to follow along. Um, so give me a second while I do that. Post it. Drive. Drive. Hi guys. Let me see if I can do that. Where would I have saved this? I saved it here. Never mind. Sorry, I'm talking to myself because that's what I do. What did I find? Well, I will find it and I will post it for you guys because I don't know where it went. Um, but I do have the PDF. So I will send that to you guys so that you can follow along. Um, so for today, before I go back into reading the story, something that's really exciting is there's a map in the front of the book now. Um, so this map is in the front of the book. It is showing us the Republic and the colonies as well as the um, areas that are flooded you can tell from global warming probably um so a lot of the country it looks like is flooded where it used to not be flooded um and there are also areas so like all the way up this this is where texas should be texas to here so this whole area right here looks like it's flooded way more than it should be because florida would be down here so our coast is definitely different than it was um yeah very crazy um so the end of the book of um legend it started us off on the first chapter however it didn't give us the whole chapter so i'm gonna finish that chapter up because it actually stopped on well, where is it? Page 12, 13. So we just saw June and Day after having escaped from the Republic and helped Day um, escape his execution. We have seen them go to Las Vegas. And in Las Vegas, they are um, looking for the Patriots because they're looking to try to meet up with them to see if Tess is okay. And then it looks like they're trying to get to the war front to see what's going on there to try to get to the colonies. Um, so, and, and rescue Eden. Um, so on page 13, so you read the first 12 and a half pages on page 13. The last thing we were at was we just learned that the quarantine has, um, has been activated in Emerald and Opal sectors in, um, LA in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is separate, sec, separated into sectors, as we know. But the sections that are labeled emerald, opal, ruby, those are the rich sections. So those sectors shouldn't really be getting the plagues because they have, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, help me. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> they get injections to prevent it. They have um, vaccines. So they have vaccines for the plague. So it's very strange. So now um, they're trying to figure out like what's going on there. So she's they're looking at jumbotrons. So this is still a June chapter. More headlines sweep by. A familiar one is about Day's execution. It plays a clip of the firing squad yard where Day's brother John took the bullets meant for Day, then fell face, face down on the ground. Day turns his eyes to the pavement. Another headline is newer. 
It says, missing. SS number 2001963034. June of Paris. Agent, Los Angeles City Patrol. Age, gender, 15, female. Height, 5'4". Hair, brown. Eyes, brown. Last seen near Batala Hall, Los Angeles, California. 350,000 Republic notes reward. If seen, report immediately to your local official. That's what the Republic wants their people to think, that I'm missing, that they hope to bring me back safe and sound. What they don't say is that they probably want me dead. I helped the country's most notorious criminal escape his execution, aided the pe- rebel patriots in the staged uprising against a military headquarters, and turned my back on the Republic. But they wouldn't want that information going pu- public, so they hunt me for qu- hunt for me quietly. The missing report shows a photo from a military ID, a face forward, unsmiling shot of me, bare faced but for a touch of gloss, dark hair tied back in a high ponytail, a gold Republic seal gleaming against the black of my coat. I'm grateful that the Phoenix tattoo hides half of my face right now. We make it to the middle of the main strip before the speakers crackle again for the pledge. Day and I stop walking. Day stumbles again and almost falls, but I manage to catch him fast enough to keep him upright. People on the street look up at the jumbotrons except for a handful of soldiers who line the edge of each intersection in order to ensure everyone's participation. The screens flicker. Their images vanish into dark into blackness and are replaced by high definition portraits of the Elector Primo. I pledge allegiance. It's almost comforting to repeat these words with everyone else on the streets, at least until I remind myself that, that all that's changed. I think back to the evening when I first captured Day, when the Elector and his son came to me to personally congratulate me for putting a notorious criminal behind bars. I recall how the Elector had looked in person. The portraits on the Jumbotrons show the same green eyes, strong jaw, and curls locked of dark hair. Curled locks of dark hair. But they leave out the coldness in his expression and the sickly color of his skin. His portraits make him seem fatherly, with healthy pink cheeks. Not how I remember him. To the flag of the Great Republic of America. Suddenly the broadcast pauses. There's silence on the streets, then a chorus of confused whispers. I frown unusual. I've never seen the plague, the pledge interrupted, not even once. And the Jumbotron system is hooked up to one screen outage shouldn't affect the rest. Day looks up to the stalled screens while my eyes dart to the soldiers lying in the street. Freak accident, he says. His labored breathing worries me. Hang on just a little longer. We can't stop here. I shake my head. No, look at the troops. I nod subtly in their direction. They changed their stances. Their rifles aren't slung over their shoulders anymore. They're holding them now. They're bracing themselves for a reaction from the the crowd. Day shakes his head slowly. He looks unsettlingly pale. Something's happened. The Elector's portrait vanishes from the Jumbotrons and is immediately replaced with a new series of images. They show a man who is a splitting image of the Elector, only much younger, barely in his 20s, with the same green eyes and dark wavy hair. In a flash, I recall the touch of excitement I'd felt when I first met him in the celebratory hall. This is Andin Stavropoulos, the son of the Elector Primo. Day's right. Something big has happened. The Republic Elector has died. The new upbeat voice takes over the speakers. Before continuing our pledge, we must instruct all soldiers and civilians to replace the Elector portraits in your homes. You may pick up a new portrait from your local police headquarters. Inspection to ensure your cooperation will commence in two weeks. The voice announces the supposed results of a a nationwide election, but there's not a single mention of the elector's death or of his son's promotion. The Republic has simply moved on to the next elector without skipping a beat, as if Andon were the same person as his father. My head swims. I try to remember what I'd learned in school about choosing a new elector. The elector always picked the successor, and a national election would confirm it. It's no surprise that Andon is next in line, but our elector had been in power for decades, long before I was born. Now he's gone. Our world has shifted in a matter of seconds. Like me and Day, everyone on the street understands what the appropriate thing to do is. As if on cue, we all bow to the Jumbotron portraits and recite the rest of the pledge that has appeared on the screens. To our Elector Primo, to our glorious states, to unity against the colonies, to our impending victory. We repeat this over and over for as long as the words stay on the screen, no one daring to stop. I glance at the soldiers lining the streets. Their hands have tightened on their rifles. Finally, after what seems like hours, the words disappear, and the Jumbotrons return to their usual news rolls. As we all begin walking again, we all begin walking again, as if nothing has happened. 
Then day stumbles. This time I feel him tremble and my heart clenches. Stay with me, I whisper. To my surprise, I almost say, stay with me, Matthias. I try to hold him up, but he slips. I'm sorry, he murmurs back. His face is shiny with sweat, his eyes shut tightly in pain. He holds two fingers to his brow. Stop. He can't make it. It look wildly around us. Too many soldiers. We still have a lot of ground to cover. No, not have to, I say firmly. Stay with me. You can make it. But it's no use this time. Before I catch him, he falls onto his hands and collapses onto the ground. Day. The Electra Primo is dead. The whole display seems pretty anticlimactic, doesn't it? You'd think the Elector's death would be accomplished by a gaudy funeral march of... Uh, it would be accompanied by a gaudy funeral march of some sort. Panic in the streets, national mourning, marching soldiers firing off salutes into the sky. An enormous banquet, flags flying low, white banners hanging over every building. Something cracked like that. But I haven't lived long enough to see an Elector die. Outside of the promotion of the late Elector's desired successor and some fake national election for show, I wouldn't know how it goes. I guess the Republic just pretends it never happened and skips right ahead to the next elector. Now, I remember reading about this in one of my grade school classes. When the time comes for a new elector primo, the country must remind the people to focus on the positive. Mourning brings weakness and chaos. Moving forward is the only way. Yeah, the government's that scared of showing uncertainty to their civilians. But I only have a second to dwell on this. We've barely finished the new pledge when a rush of pain hits my leg. Before I can stop myself, I double over and collapse down onto my good knee. A couple of soldiers turn their heads in our direction. I laugh as loud as I can, pretending the tears in my eyes are from amusement. June plays along, but I can see the fear on, their, on her face. Come on, she whispers frantically. One of her slender arms wraps around my waist, and I try to take the hand she offers me. All around the sidewalk, people are noticing us for the first time. You have to get up. Come on. It takes all my strength to keep a smile on my face. Focus on June. I try to stand and fall again. Damn, the pain is too much. White light stabs at the back of my eyes. Breathe, I tell myself. I can't faint in the middle of a Vegas strip. What's the matter, soldier? A young hazel-eyed corporal is standing in front of us with his arms crossed. I can tell he's kind of in a hurry, but apparently it's not urgent enough to keep him from checking on us. He raises an eyebrow at me. You're all right? You're pale as porcelain, kid. Run. I feel an urge to scream at June. Get out of here. There's still time. But she saves me from speaking. You'll have to forgive him, sir, she says. I've never seen a Vlagio patron drink so much in one sitting. She shakes her head regretfully and waves him back with one hand. You might want to step away, she continues. I think he needs to throw up. I find myself amazed, yet again, at how smoothly she can become another person. The same way she fooled me on the streets of Lake. The corporal gives her an ambivalent frown before turning back to me. His eyes focus on my injured leg. Even though it's hidden under a light, thick layer of pants, he studies it. I'm not sure your escort knows what she's talking about. Seems like you could use a trip to the hospital. He raises a hand to wave down a passing medic truck. I shake my head. No, thank you, sir. I manage to say with a weak laugh. This darling's telling me too many jokes. Gotta catch my breath is all, then gotta sleep it off. Where? But he's not paying attention to what I'm saying. I curse silently. If we go to the hospital, they'll fingerprint us, and then they'll know exactly who we are, the Republic's two most wanted fugitives. I don't dare glance at June, but I know she's trying to find a way out, too. Then, someone pokes her head out from behind the corporal. She's a girl both June and I recognize right away, although I've never seen her in freshly polished Republic uniform before. A pair of pilot goggles hang around her neck. She walks around the corporal and stands in front of me, smiling indulgently. Hey, she says. I thought that was you. I saw you stumbling around like a madman all the way down the street. The corporal watches as she drags me to my feet and claps me hard in the back. I wince, but give her a grin that says I've known her all my life. Missed you, I decided to say. The corporal gestures impatiently at the new girl. You know him? The girl flips her black bobbed hair and gives, gives him the most flirtatious grin I've ever seen. Gives them, him the most flirtatious grin I've ever seen in my life. Know him, sir. We were in the same squadron our first year. She winks at me. She winks at me. Seems like he's been up to no good in the clubs again. The corporal snorts in disinterest and rolls her eyes. Rolls his eyes. Air Force kids, huh? Well, make sure he doesn't cause another public scene. I've half a mind to call your commander. And he seems to remember what he's been rushing to do and hurries away. 
I exhale. Could we have pulled any closer of a call? After he leaves, the girl smiles wisely at me. Even under a sleeve, I can tell that one of her arms is in a cast. My barracks are close by, she suggests. Her voice has an edge to it that tells me she's not happy to see us. How about you rest there for a while? You can even bring your new plaything. The girl nods at June as she says this. Katie. She hasn't changed a bit since the afternoon I met her, when I thought she was just a bartender with a vine tattoo. Back before I knew she was a patriot. Lead the way, I reply. Katie helps June guide me down another block. She stops us at an elaborately carved front door of Venzia, a high-rise set of barracks, then ushers us past a board entrance guard and through the building's main hall. The ceiling is high enough to make me, make me dizzy, and I catch glimpses of Republic flags and electric portraits hanging between each stone pillar that lines the walls. Guards are already rushing to replace the portraits with updated ones. Katie guides us along while blabbing a nonstop stream of random small talk. Her black hair is even shorter now, cut straight and even with her chin, and her smooth lidded eyes are smudged with a deep navy eyeshadow. I never notice that she and I are pretty much the same height. Soldiers swarm back and forth, and I keep expecting one of them to recognize me from my wanted ads and sound the alarm. They'll notice June behind her disguise, or realize that Katie isn't a real soldier. Then they'll all be on top of us, and we won't even have a chance. But no one questions us, and my limp actually helps us blend in here. I can see several other soldiers with arm and leg casts. Katie guides us onto the elevators. I've never ridden one, because I've never been in a building with full electricity. We get off on the eighth floor. Fewer soldiers are up here. In fact, we pass through a completely empty section of hallway. Here, she finally drops her perky facade. You two look about as good as gutter rats, Katie mutters as she taps softly against one of the doors. That leg's still bugging you, yeah? You're pretty stubborn if you came all the way out here to find us. She sneers at June. Those gaudy, obnoxious lights strung on your dress nearly blinded me. June exchanges a glance with me. I know exactly what she's thinking. How in the world can a group of criminals be living in one of Vegas's largest military barracks? Something clicks behind the door. Katie throws it open, then walks in with her arms outstretched. Welcome to our humble home, she declares with a grand sweep of her hands, at least for the next few days. Not too shabby, yeah? I don't know what to ex I expected to see. A group of teens, maybe, or some low-budget operation? Instead, we enter a room where only two other people are waiting for us. I look around in surprise. I've never been inside a real Republic barrack before, but this one must be reserved for officers. There's no way they'd use this to house regular soldiers. First off, it's not a long room with rows of bunk beds. It could be an upscale apartment for one or two officials. There are extra lights on the ceiling and in the lamps. Marble tiles of silver and cream cover the floor. The walls are painted in alternate, alternating shades of off-white and a deep wine color. And the couches and tables have thick red rugs cushioning their legs. A small monitor sits flush against one of the walls, mutely showing the same newsreel that's playing on the jumbotrons outside. I let out a low whistle. Not shabby at all. I smile, but it fades away when I glance over at June. Her face is tense beneath her phoenix tattoo. Even though her eyes stay neutral, she's definitely unhappy and not as impressed as I am. Well, why should she be? I bet her own apartment had been just as nice as this. Her eyes wander around the room in an organized sweep, noticing things that I'd probably never see. Sharp and calculating, like any good Republic soldier. One of her hand lingers, hands lingers near her waist, where she keeps a pair of knives. An instant later, my attention turns to a girl standing behind the center couch. She locks her eyes onto mine and squints as if to make sure she's really seeing me. Her mouth opens in shock, small pink lips forming an O. Her hair is too short to braid now. It drapes to the middle of her neck in a messy bob. Wait a sec. My heart skips a beat. I hadn't recognized her because of that hair. Tess. You're here, she exclaims. Before I can reply, Tess runs over to me and throws her arms around my neck. I hobble backward, struggling to keep my balance. It's really you. I can't believe it. You're here. You're okay. I can't think straight. For a second, I can't even feel the pain in my leg. All I can do is wrap my arms, my arms tight around Tess's waist, bury my head in her shoulder, and close my eyes. The weight of my mind lifts and leaves me weak with relief. I take a deep breath, taking comfort in her warmth and the sweet scent of her hair. I'd seen her every single day since I was 12 years old, but after only a few weeks apart, I can suddenly see that she's not that 10-year-old kid I met in back alley. She seems different, older. I feel something stir in my chest. Glad to see you, cousin, I whisper. You look good. 
Tess just squeezes me hard, tighter. I realize that she's holding her breath. She's trying hard not to cry. Katie is the one who interrupts the moment. Enough, she says. This isn't the damn opera. We break apart the, to laugh awkwardly at each other, and Tess wipes her eyes with the back of a hand. She exchanges an uncomfortable smile with June. Finally, she turns away and hurries back to where another person, a man, is waiting. Katie opens her mouth to say something else, but the man stops her with a gloved hand. This surprises me. Judging from how bossy she is, I would have assumed that Katie's in charge of the group. Can't imagine this girl taking orders from anyone. But now she just purses her lips and flops onto the couch as the man rises to address us. He's tall, probably in his early 40s, and built with a bit of strength in the shoulders. His skin is a light brown, and his curly hair is pulled back into a short, frizzy tail. A pair of thin, black-rimmed glasses rest on his nose. So, you must be the one we've all heard so much about, he says. Pleased to meet you, Day. I wish I could do better than standing hunched over with pain. Likewise, thank you for seeing us. Please forgive us for not escorting you both to Vegas ourselves, he says apologetically, adjusting his glasses. It seems cold, but I don't like risking my rebel needlessly. His eyes swivel to June. And I'm guessing you're the Republic's prodigy. June inclines her head in a gesture that oozes high class. Your esc escort costume is so convincing, though. Let's just conduct a quick test to prove your identity. Please close your eyes. June hesitates for a second, then obliges. The man waves a hand toward the front of the room. Now, hit the target on the wall with one of your knives. I blink, then study the walls. Target? I hadn't even noticed that a dartboard with a three-ring target is on one of the walls near the door we came through. But June doesn't miss a beat. She flips out, out a knife from her waist, turns, and throws it straight toward the dartboard without opening her eyes. It slams deep into the board, just a few inches shy of the bullseye. The man claps his hand. Even Katie gr utters a grunt of approval, followed by a roll of her eyes. Oh, for Christ's sake, I hear her mutter. June turns back to us and waits for the man's response. I'm stunned into silence. Never in my life have I seen anyone handle a blade like that. And even though I've seen plenty of amazing things from June, this is the first time I've witnessed her use a weapon. The sight sends both a thrill and a shiver through me, bringing memories that I've forced into a closet in my mind. Thoughts I keep buried if I want to stay focused, keep going. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Paris, the man says, tucking his hands behind his back. Now, tell me, what brings you here? June nods at me, so I speak up instead. We need your help, I say. Please. I came for Tess, but I'm also trying to find my brother Eden. I don't know what the Republic's using him for or where they're keeping him. We figured you were the only people outside the military who might be able to get information. And finally, it seems like my leg needs to be operated on. I suck in my breath with, as another spasm of agony sears my wound. The man glances down at the leg, his eyebrows furrow in concern. That's quite a list, he says. You should sit. You seem a bit unsteady on your feet. He waits patiently for me to move, but when I don't budge, he clears his throat. Well, you've introduced yourselves. So it's only fair for me to do the same. My name is Razor, and I currently head the Patriots. I've been leaving the organization for quite a few years, longer than you've been causing trouble on the streets of Lake. You want our help day, but I seem to remember you're declining our invitations to join us several times. He turns to tinted windows that face the pyramid-shaped landing docks lining the strip. The view from here is amazing. Airships glide back and forth in the night sky, covered in lights, several of them docking right over the pyramid's top like puzzle pieces. Occasionally, we see formations of fighter jets, black eagle-like shapes, taking off from and landing on the airship decks. It's a never-ending stream of activity. My eyes dart from building to building. The pyramid docks in particular would be the easiest to run, with grooves cut into each side and step-like ridges lining their edges. I realize that Razor is waiting again for me to respond. I wasn't entirely comfortable with your organization's body count, I offer. But now apparently you are, Razor says. His words are scolding, but his tone is sympathetic as he puts his palms together and presses the, finger t his, the fingertips to his lips. Because you need us. Correct? Well, I can't argue with that. I'm sorry, I say. We're running out of options. But believe me, I'll understand if you turn us away. Just don't turn us into the Republic, please. I force a smile. He chuckles at my sarcasm. I focus on the crooked bump of his nose and wonder if he'd broken it before. At first, I was tempted to let both of you wander Vegas until you were caught, he continues. His voice has the smoothness of an, smoothness of an aristocrat, cultured and charismatic. I'll be blunt with you. 
your skills are not as valuable to me as they used to be. Okay. Over the years, we've recruited other runners. Now, with all due respect, adding another one to our team isn't a priority. Your friend already knows, he pauses and looks at June, that the Patriots are not a charity. You're asking us for a great deal of help. What will you give us in return? You can't be carrying much money. June gives me a pointed look. She may have warned me about this on our train ride, but I can't give up now. If the Patriots turn us down, we'll really be on our own. We don't have a lot of money, I admit. I'm not going to speak for June, but if there is anything I can do in exchange for your help, just say the word. Razor crosses his arms, then walks to the department's bar, an elaborate granite counter embedded in the wall and shelving dozens of glass bottles of all shapes and sizes. He takes his time pouring a drink. We wait. When he finishes preparing it, he takes the glass in one hand and wanders back to us. There is something you can offer, he starts. Fortunately, you've arrived on a very interesting night. He takes a sip of the drink and sits down on the couch. As you probably learned while down on the street, the former Electra Primo died today. Something, something many in the Republic's elite circles have seen coming. At any rate, his son Andon is now the Republic's new elector. Practically a boy and greatly disliked by his father's senators. He leans forward, saying each word carefully and with weight. Rarely has the Republic been as vulnerable as it is now. There will never be a better time to spark a revolution. Your physical skills might be expendable to us, but there are two things you can give us that your, our other runners can't. One, your fame your status as the people's champion. And two, he points his drink at June, your lovely friend. I stiffen at that, but Razor's eyes are warm as honey, and I find myself waiting to hear the rest of his proposal. I'd be happy to take you in, and you'll both be well cared for. Today, we can get you an excellent doctor and pay for an operation that'll make your leg better than new. I don't know the whereabouts of your brother, but we can help you find him. And eventually, we can help you both escape into the colonies if that's what you want. In return, We'd ask for your help with a new project, no questions asked. But you'll both need to pledge your allegiance to the Patriots before I'll reveal any details about what you'll be doing. These are my terms. What do you think? June looks from me to Razor. Then she lifts her chin higher. I'm in. I ple I'll pledge allegiance to the Patriots. There's a slight falter in her words, like she knows she's truly turned her back on the Republic. I swallow hard. I hadn't expected her to agree so quickly. I thought she would need some persuading before she committed herself to a group that she obviously hated just a few weeks ago. The fact that she says yes tugs at my heart. If June is giving herself to the Patriots, then she must realize that we have no better choice. And she's doing this for my sake. I raise my own voice. Me too. Razor smiles, rises from the couch, and holds up his drink as if to toast us. Then he sets down on the coffee table and comes over to give each of us a firm handshake. It's official then. You're going to help us assassinate the new Elector Primo. June. This is a kind of a long chapter, you guys. Hold on. Ugh, eh, I'll do it, whatever. June. I don't trust Razor. I don't trust him because I don't understand how he can afford to hide out in such nice quarters. An officer's quarters, in Vegas of all places. These rugs are worth at least 29,000 notes. Made, made from some sort of expensive synthetic fur. Ten electric lights in one room, all switched on. His uniform is spotless and new. He even has a customized gun hanging on his belt. Stainless steel, probably lightweight. Hand embellished? My brother used to have guns like that. 18,000 notes and up for a single one. What's more, Razor's gun must be hacked. No way the Republic is tracking those for fingerprints or locations. Where did the Patriots get the money and skills to hack such advanced equipment? This all leads me to two theories. One, Razor must be some sort of commander in the Republic, a double-crossing officer. How else can he stay in this barrack apartment without being detected? Or two, the Patriots are being funded by someone with deep pockets. The colonies? Possibly. In spite of all my suspicions and guesses, Razor's offer is still as good as we're going to get. We have no money to buy help on the black market. And without help, we have no chance of finding Aiden or making it to the colonies. Also, I'm not even sure we could have turned down Razor's offer. He certainly hasn't threatened us in any way, but I doubt he'd just let us walk back out onto the streets either. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Day waiting for my response to Razor's statement. 
All I need to see are the paleness of his lips and the little pain laced across his face, just a few of the dozen signs of his fading strength. At this point, I think his life depends on our deal with Razor. Assassinating the new elector, I say. Done. My words sound foreign and distant. For a moment, I think back on meeting Andon and his late father in the ball, at the ball, ce celebrating Day's capture. The thought of killing Andon makes my stomach churn. He's the Republic's elector now. After everything that happened to my family, I should be happy for the opportunity to kill him. But I'm not, and it confuses me. If Razor notices my hesitation, he doesn't show it. Instead, he nods approvingly. I'll put out an urgent call, urgent call for a medic. They probably won't be able to come until midnight. That's when the shift changes. It's the fastest we can be on such a tight schedule. Meanwhile, let's get the two of you out of those disguises into something more presentable. He glances over at Katie. She's leaning against the couch with hunched shoulders and an irritated scowl, chewing absently on a lock of her hair. Show them to the shower and give them a pair of fresh uniforms. Afterward, we'll have a late supper and we can talk more about our plan. He spreads his arm wide. Welcome to the Patriots, my young friend. We're glad to have you. And just like that, we're officially bound to them. Maybe it's not such a bad thing either. Maybe I never should have argued with Day about this in the first place. Katie motions for us to follow her into an adjoining hall in the apartment and guides us to a spacious ba bathroom, complete with marble tiles and porcelain sinks, mirror and toilet, bathtub and shower with frosted glass walls. I can't help admiring it all. This is wealth beyond even what I had in my Ruby Sector apartment. Don't be all night about it, she says. Take turns or get cozy and shower together if that's faster. Just be out here in half an hour. Katie grins at me, although the smile doesn't touch her eyes, and gives Day a thumbs up as he lean, heav leans heat heavily on my shoulder. She turns away and disappears back down the hall before I can reply. I don't think she's forgiven me entirely about breaking her arm. Day slouches the instant Katie's gone. Can you help me sit down? He whispers. I put the toilet cover down and ease him gently onto it. He stretches out his good leg and tenses his jaw as he tries to straighten out the injured one. A moan escapes his lips. I've got to admit, he mutters, I've had better days. At least Tess is safe, I reply. This eases some of the pain in his eyes. Yes, he echoes, sighing deeply. At least Tess is safe. I feel an unexpected twinge of guilt. Tess's face had looked so sweet, so wholly good. And the two of them were separated because of me. Am I good? I don't really know. I help Day take off his jacket and cap. His long hair drapes in strings across my arms. Let me see that leg. I kneel and pull a knife from my belt. I slice the fabric of his pant leg up the middle of his thigh. His lean leg muscles are tense, lean and tense. My hands tremble as they brush along his skin. Gingerly, I pull the fabric apart to expose the bandaged wound. We both suck in our breath. The cloth has a massive circle of dark, wet blood. And underneath it, underneath it, the wound is oozing and swelling. That medic better get here soon, I say. Are you sure you can shower on your own? Day jerks his eyes away and his cheeks turn red. Of course I can. I raise an eyebrow to him. You can't even stand. Fine, he hesitates and blushes. I guess I can use some help. I swallow. Well, the bath instead then. Let's do what we have to do. I start filling up the bathtub with warm water. Then I take the knife and sl cut, slowly cut through the blood-soaked bandages that wrapped around Day's wound. We sit there in silence, neither of us meeting the other's eyes. The wound itself is as bad as ever. A fist-sized mass of pulp flesh that Day avoids looking at. Gross. You don't have to do this, he mutters, rolling his shoulders in an attempt to relax. Right. I smile a wry smile. I'll just wait outside the bathroom door and come help you after you slip and knock yourself out. No, Day replies. I mean you don't have to join the Patriots. My smile dies. Well, we don't have much of a choice, do we? Razor wants both of us on board, or he's not going to help us at all. Day's hand touches my arm for a second, stopping me in the middle of untying his boots. What do you think of their plan? Assassinating the new elector? I turn away, concentrating on unlacing and loosening each of his boots as carefully as I can. It's a question I haven't figured out yet, so I deflect it. Well, what do you think? I mean, you go out of your way to avoid hurting people. This must be kind of a shock. I'm startled when Day just shrugs. So time and place for everything. His voice is cold harsher than usual. I never saw the point in killing Republic soldiers. I mean, I hate them, but they're not the source. They just obey their superiors. The Elector, though, I don't know. 
getting rid of the person in charge of this whole gaudy system seems like a small price to pay for starting a revolution, don't you think? I can't help but feel some admiration for Day's attitude. What he say, what he says makes perfect sense. Still, I wonder if he would have said the same thing a few weeks ago, before everything that happened to his family. I don't dare mention the time I'd been introduced to Andon in the celebratory hall. It's harder to reconcile yourself to killing someone who you've actually met and admired in person. Well, like I said, we don't have a choice. Day's lips tighten. He knows I'm not telling him what I really think. It must be hard for you to turn your back on your elector, he says. His hands stay slack beside him. Hi, Grover. His phone is on. I keep my head down and start pulling off his boots. Hey. While I pull about his boots aside, Tay shrugs out of his jacket and starts unbuttoning his vest. It reminds me of when I first first met him back on the streets of Lake. Back then, he would take off his vest every night and give it to Tess to use as a pillow. That is the most I'd ever seen Day undress. Now, he unbuttoned his collar shirt, exposing the rest of his throat and a sliver of his chest. I see the pendant looped around his neck, the United States quarter dollar covered with smooth metal on both sides. In the quiet dark of the rail car, he told me about his father bringing it back from the war front. He pauses when he finishes undoing the last button and then closes his eyes. You can see the pain slashed across his face and the slight tears at me, and the sight t tears at me. The Republic's most wanted criminal is just a boy sitting before me, suddenly vulnerable, laying all his weaknesses out for me to see. I straighten and reach up to his shirt. My hands touch the skin of his shoulders. I try to keep my breathing even my mind sharp and calculated. But as I help him pull the shirt off and reveal his bare arms and chest, I can feel the, corner, feel the corners of my logic growing fuzzy. Day is fit and lean under his clothes, his skin surprisingly smooth, except for an occasional scar. He has four faint ones on his chest and waist, another one that's a thin diagonal line running from left collarbone to right hip bone, and a healing scab on his arm. He holds me with his gaze. He's very close now, close enough for me to see the tiny rippled imperfection in the ocean of his left eye. His breaths come out hot and shallow. Heat rises on my cheek, but I don't want to turn away. We're doing this together, right? He whispers. You and me? You want to be here? Yeah? There's guilt in his questions. Yes, I reply. I chose this. Day pulls me close enough for our noses to touch. I love you. My heart flips in excitement at the, at the desire in his voice, but at the same time, the technical part of my brain instantly flares up. Highly improbable, it scoffs. A month ago, he didn't even know I existed. So I blurt out, no, you don't, not yet. Day furrows his eyebrows as if I heard him. I mean it. I'm helpless against the ache in his voice, but still, they're just the words of a boy in the heat of the moment. I try to force myself to say the same thing back, but the words freeze on my tongue. Grover, stop. How can he be so sure of this? I certainly don't understand all these strange new feelings inside of me. Am I here because I love him or because I owe him? Day doesn't wait for my answer. Hold on. I'm not gonna read this next paragraph because it's a little smoochy. <laughs> so smooch, 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 they kiss. Okay. Um, Katie's been gone for eight minutes. I breathe. They expect us back there in 22. Day twines his hands through my hair and gently pulls my head back. He says, let them wait, he murmurs. Da, 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 da. Yeah, they're smooching a bunch. Hold on, we're going to keep going. Da, da, da. Okay. Um, I pour some liquid bath gel into the tub and splash the water around until it props up. Then I get one of the towels hanging from the bathroom and wrap it around Day's waist. He fump, manages to fumble underneath the towel and loosen his pants. I help him tug them off. The towel covers everything that needs to be covered, but I still avert my eyes. I help Day, now wearing just the towel and his pendant to his feet. And after some struggling, we manage to get his good leg into the tub so I can lower him into the water. It takes 15 minutes to scrub him and all, and all of his hair clean. When we're finished, I help him stand and close my eyes as he grabs a dry towel wrapped around his waist. The thought of opening my eyes right now and seeing him naked sends blood coursing through my veins. Oh my God. I'm annoyed by how obvious the heat of my blush must be. The moment's over. I spend another few minutes struggling to get him out of the tub. When he's finally done and sitting on the toilet seat cover, I walk over to the bathroom door. 
I hadn't noticed before, but someone had opened the door a crack and dropped off a new pair of soldier uniforms for us. Ground battalion uniforms with Nevada buttons. It's going to feel weird to be a, a Republic soldier again. But I bring them inside. Day gives me a weak smile. Thanks. Feels good to be clean. His pain seems to bring back some of the worst of his memories from the past few weeks. And now all his emotion plays out plainly on his face. His smiles have become half of what they used to be. It's as if most of his happiness had died the night he lost John. And only a tiny slice of it remains. Mostly a piece that he saves for Eden and Tess. I secretly hope he saves a part of his joy for me too. Turn around and change into your clothes, I say. And wait outside the bathroom for me. I'll be quick. We get back to the living room seven minutes later. Razor and Katie are waiting for us. Tess sits alone in the corner of the couch, her legs folded up to her chin, watching us with a guarded expression. An instant later, I smell the aromas of baked chicken and potatoes. My eyes dart to the lit dining room table where four dishes loaded with food sit neatly, beckoning to us. I try not to react to the smell, but my stomach rumbles. Excellent, Razor says, smiling at us. He lets his eyes linger on me. Did you clean up nicely? Then he turns to Day and shakes his head. We arranged some food to be brought up, but since you're having surgery within the next few hours, you're going to have to keep your stomach empty. I'm sorry. I know you must be hungry. June, please help yourself. Day's eyes are also fixed on the food. That's just great, he mutters. I join the others at the table while Day stretches out on the couch and makes himself as comfortable as he can. I'm about to pick up my plate and sit next to him, but Tess beats me to it, seating herself on the edge of the couch so her back touches Day's side. As Razor, Katie, and I eat in silence at the table, I occasionally steal glances at the couch. Day and Tess talk and laugh with the ease of two people who've known each other for years. I concentrate on my food. I've counted off five minutes in my head when Razor finally takes a sip of his drink and leans back. I watch him closely, still wondering why one of the Patriots leaders, the head of a group that I've always associated with savagery, is so polite. Mrs. Paris, he says, how much do you know about our new elector? I shake my head. Not much, I'm afraid. Beside me, Ki beside me, Katie snorts and continues digging into her dinner. You've met him before, though, Razor says, revealing what I'd hoped to keep from Day. The night at the ball, the one held to celebrate Day's capture. He kissed your hand, correct? Day pauses in his conversation with Tess. I cringe inwardly. Razor doesn't seem to notice my discomfort. Andon Stavropoulos is an interesting young man, he says. The late elector loved him a great deal. Now that Andon is elector... The senators are uneasy. The people are angry, and they couldn't care less if Andon is different from the last elector. No matter what speeches Andon gives to please them, all they're going to see is a wealthy man who has no idea how to heal their suffering. They're furious with Andon for letting Day's execution go through, for hunting him down, for not saying a word against his father's, father's policies, for putting a price on finding June. The list goes on. The late elector had an iron grip on the military. Now the people just see a boy king who has a chance to rise up and become another version of his father. These are the weaknesses we want to exploit. And this brings us to the plan we currently have in mind. You seem to know a great deal about the young elector. You also seem to know a great deal about what happened at the celebratory ball, I reply. I can't hold in my suspicion any longer. I suppose that's because you were also a guest that night? You must be a Republic officer, but without a rank high enough to get you in an audience with the elector... I study the room's rich velvet carpets and granite counters. These are your actual office quarters, aren't they? Razor seems a little put off by my criticism of his rank, which, as usual, is a fact that I hadn't meant as an insult, but quickly brushes it off with a laugh. I can see there'll be no secrets with you, special girl. Well, my official title is Commander Andrew DeSoto, and I run three of the capital city patrols. The Patriots gave me my street name. I've been organizing most of their missions for a little over a decade. Day and Tess are both listening to me intently now. You're a public officer? Day echoes uncertainly, his eyes glued to Razor. A commander from the Capitol? Hmm. Why are you helping the Patriots? Razor nods, resting both of his elbows on the, on the dinner table and pressing his hands together. I, should so I suppose I should start by giving both of you some details about how we work. The Patriots have been around for 30 or so years. They started as a loose collection of rebels. Within the last 15 years, they've banded together in an attempt to organize themselves and their cause. Razor's coming changed everything, so I hear. Katie pipes up. They'd rotated through leaders all the time, and funding had always been a problem. Razor's connections to the colonies has been bringing in more money for missions than ever before. Matias had been busier over the last couple of years dealing with Patriot attacks in Los Angeles, I recall. 
Razor nods at Katie's words. We're fighting to reunite the colonies of the Republic, to return the United States to its former glory. His eyes take on a determined gleam, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve our goal. The old United States, I think, as Razor continues. Day had mentioned the United States to me during our escape from Los Angeles, although I was still skeptical, until now. How does the organization work, I ask. We keep an eye out for people who have talents and skills we need, and then we try to recruit them, Razor says. Usually we're good at getting people on board, although some people take longer than others. He pauses to tip his glass in Day's direction. I'm considered a leader in the Patriots. There are only a few of us working from the inside and architecting the Re Rebels' missions. Katie here is a pilot. Katie waves a hand around as she continues to inhale her food. She joins us after... She joined us after she was expelled from an airship academy in the colonies. Day's surgeon is a medic, and young Tess here is a medic in training. We also have fighters, runners, scouts, hackers, escorts, and so on. I would place you as a fighter, June, although your abilities seem to cross into several categories. And Day, of course, is the best runner I've ever seen. Razor smiles a little and finishes his drink. The two of you should technically be a new category altogether. Celebrities. That's how you're going to be most useful to us. And that's why I didn't throw you both back out on the street. So kind of you, Day says. What's the plan? Razor points at me. Earlier, I asked you how much you knew about our elector. I heard a few rumors today. They say Andon was quite taken with you at the ball. Someone heard him asking if you could be transferred to a patrol in the capital. There's even a rumor that he wanted you tapped to train as Senate's next princeps. princeps. The next princeps? I shake my head automatically, overwhelmed by the idea. Probably nothing more than a rumor. Even 10 years of training wouldn't be enough to prepare me for that. Razor just laughs at my declaration. What's a princeps? Day speaks up. He sounds annoyed. Some of us aren't versed in the Republic's hierarchy. The leader of the Senate, Razor replies casually, without turning in his direction. The elector's shadow, his or her partner in command, and sometimes more. It frequently turns out the way, that way in the end, after a requisite decade of training, Andon's mother was the last princeps, after all. I glance in instinctively toward Day. His jaw is tight, and he's holding very still. Little signs that say he'd rather not be hearing that what the elector thinks of me, or that he might want me as a future partner. I clear my throat. His rumors are exaggerated, and insist again. Just as uncomfortable as Day is with this conversation. And even if that were true, I'd still be one of several princeps in training. And I can guarantee you that their other choices would be experienced senators. But how are you planning to use that information in your assassination? Do you think I'm going to? Katie breaks through my words with a loud laugh. You're blushing, a Paris, she says. Do you like the idea that Andon's crushing on you? No, I say a bit too quickly. Now I feel the heat rising on my face, although I'm pretty sure it's because Katie is irritating me. Don't be so gaudy arrogant, she says. Andon is a handsome guy with a lot of power and a lot of options. It's okay to feel flattered. I'm sure Day understands. Razor saves me from responding by frowning in disapproval. Katie, please. He makes a, she makes a pouty face at him and returns to her meal. I glance at the couch. Day is staring up at the ceiling. After a short, short pause, Razor goes on. Even now, Andon can't be sure that you did everything against the Republic on purpose. For all he knows... You may have taken, been taken hostage when Day escaped, or forced to join Day against your will. There's enough uncertainty for him to insist that the government list you as a missing person instead of a wanted traitor. My point is this. Andon is interested in you, and that means he can be influenced by what you tell him. So you want me to go back to the Republic? I say. My words seem to echo. From the corner of my eye, I see Tess shift unhappily on the couch. Her mouth quivers with some unspoken phrase. Razor nods. Exactly. Originally, I was going to use spies from my own Republic patrols to get close to Andon. But now we have a better alternative. You. You tell the Elector that the Patriots are going to try to kill him. But the plan you tell him about will be a decoy. While everyone's distracted with the fake plan, we'll strike with the real one. Our goal is not only to kill Andon, but to turn the country completely against him, so that his regime will be doomed, even if our plan fails. That's what you two can do for us. Now, we've heard reports that the new elector is going to be heading to, for the war front within the next couple weeks to get updates and progress reports from his colonels. The RS Dynasty airship launches toward the war front early tomorrow afternoon, and all of my squadrons will be on it. 
Day will join me, Katie, and Tess on that ride. We'll organize the real assassination, and you'll lead Andon to it. Razor crosses his arms and studies our faces, waiting for re our reactions. Day finally finds his voice and interrupts. This is going to be incredibly dangerous for June, he argues as he props himself straighter on the couch. How can you be sure she'll even reach the elector after the military gets, gets her back? How do you know they won't just start torturing information out of her? Trust me, I know how to avoid that, Razor replies. I haven't forgotten about your brother either. If June can get close enough to the elector, she might fi may find out where Eden is on her own. Day's eyes light up after that, and Tess squeezes her, his shoulder. As for you, Day, I've never seen the public rally behind anyone the way they have for you. Did you know that streaking your hair red has become a fashion statement overnight? Razor chuckles and waves a hand at Day's head. That's power. Right now, you probably have just as much influence as the elector. Maybe more. If we can find a way to use your fame to work people up into a frenzy, by the time the assassination happens, Congress will be powerless to stop a revolution. And what do you plan to do with that revolution? Day asks. Razor leans forward, and his face turns, turns determined, even hopeful. You want to know why I joined the Patriots? For the same reason you've been working against the Republic. The Patriots know how you've suffered. We've all seen the sacrifices you've made for your family, the pain the Republic has caused you. June, Razor says, nodding at me. I cringe. I don't want a reminder of what happened to Matthias. I have seen your suffering too. Your whole family destroyed by the nation you once loved. I've lost count of the number of Patriots who have come to, from similar circumstances. Day turns to stare back up to the ceiling at the mention of his family. His eyes stay dry, but when Tess reaches out and grabs his, his hand, he tightens his finger around, fingers around hers. The world outside the Republic isn't perfect, but freedoms and opportunities do exist out there. And all we need to do is let that light shine into the Republic itself. Our country is on the brink. All it needs now is a hand to tip it over. He rises halfway off his chair and points at his chest. We can be that hand. With a revolution, the Republic comes crashing down. And together, with the colonies, we can take it and rebuild it into something great. It'll be the United States again. People will live freely. Day, your little brother will grow up in a better place. That's worth risking our lives for. That's worth dying for, isn't it? I can tell Razor's words are stirring something in Day, coaxing out a gleam in his eyes that takes me aback with the intensity. Something worth dying for, Day repeats. I should be excited too, but somehow, still, the thought of the Republic crashing down sends a pulse of nausea through me. I don't know if it's brainwashing, years of Republic doctrine drilled into my brain. That feeling lingers though, along with a flood of shame and self-hate. Everything I'm familiar with is gone. That's the end of the chapter. All right, so we will keep going with this tomorrow. We are on page 49. Interesting. So um, we'll keep going with that and uh, we will uh, see how that goes. All right. So um, I will talk to you guys again later and then maybe we will meet on Friday to talk about what's happening in Prodigy so far. I'm expecting we'll probably read these chapters are much longer in this book than they were in last book. So we'll probably end up reading like two chapters a day, which will be about 30 to 40 pages max, I'm guessing. Yeah, these, these chapters are very long. So I'll probably read two, maybe three chapters a day. Okay. Um, all right. So I will talk to you guys later. I hope you enjoy the chapter and uh, hope you guys are doing well. Great. Right, bye.